the endless love and faithfulness of Jesus Christ as our Savior. Overcome the deficiencies of the preacher. They are significant. And bless the reading and the preaching of your holy word to bring forth fruit in our hearts to love you more, to serve you better. And we ask it all in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. We live in a cultural moment where the the prevailing mindset includes efforts to define the rules by their exceptions. Our, Our most heated moral debates usually involve attempts to to revise traditional understandings of life and society by appealing to to very out-of-the-ordinary instances. And and by appealing to the extraordinary, to, to widen our perception of what seems ordinary, this approach works to normalize the breach of standing rules precisely to undermine the rule itself. With the rule compromised, we we have no standard to to regulate life's proper conduct. And our our opening anecdote today lacks, I I suppose, our usual levity because, because our passage's topic today seems deathly serious to me. I don't really feel the room for lightness for a number of reasons as we, can, as we work through Mark's gospel and come to his presentation of Jesus' teaching on divorce. Uh, we live in a time of exponentially greater divorces than any other time in history of which I'm aware, making the consideration of this topic uh, maximally relevant. I also know that you've trusted me to bring gospel news every Lord's Day, to shepherd you in truth, encouragement, assurance, and godliness. And today, that trust comes with at least a felt tension for me. So I think, I I imagine some of you likely want me to wave off the grievous consequences of divorce to make everything feel all right, no matter what decisions we make. And I imagine others want want me to lambast divorce without qualification, casting aside regard for victims and perpetrators who need grace and wise but biblically informed support to measure their circumstances according to Scripture. And I've greatly wrestled with the best way to come at this passage, knowing that I won't satisfy everyone, or perhaps anyone, and am easily likely to upset many if I make the wrong or even the right move here. Uh, The wisest thing to me has seemed to emphasize what our one passage in Mark emphasizes, uh, rather than drifting into a topical Statement: a topical examination of divorce holistically as, as if I would be attempting to give all the caveats and bring in all the additional information that we might make or need. And most pointedly, I know that one of the very first questions that people ask as soon as the topic gets mentioned is, can I get remarried after getting divorced? And as we think about our passage today, we need to note that although there are answers to that question, Jesus doesn't directly answer that question here. His address is to the opposing religious leaders about, and, and isn't about providing a roadmap to what we can or cannot do in various situations in which we might find ourselves in this fallen age. His address is about naming an evil as evil and standing against it. And that is, I think, the approach 
that I have to take this morning. Um, Admitting that they exist, we're not outlining the exceptions and what to do with them. We're standing on the rule. And some may already have bristled that I've said we're naming an evil, meaning that divorce is an evil. Now, what I do not mean, what I do not mean, is that every divorced person is evil. I have not said anything about labeling people. I'm aware that some circumstances make divorce permissible, reasonable, and arguably necessary. And so saying that divorce is an evil is not saying that it's never understandable or never needed. But even good reason for a divorce does not make divorce itself, or even that divorce, a good thing. In fact, good reasons for ending a marriage uh, underscore how divorce as such cannot be a good thing, because it is evil that we treat each other in such a way as to make divorce necessary. Divorce happens only because of sin. No one ever says we had a great run with no complaints, even now, uh, for all these years, and so we should call it quits. Marriages end because something, something has gone wrong. I have said that divorce always happens because of sin, but have not said that divorce always happens because of your sin. There are, there, there are cases wherein one person is truly and purely the victim. I realize that's true. Uh, and yet, I think that those cases are wildly rare. The, the notion that sort of is growing in a number of states, including our own, the notion of no fault, no fault divorce is ludicrous. Someone is always at, at fault. There are no accidental divorces. Most divorces could probably be slated as everyone's fault divorce. Because even when that fault, even when that fault is not equally distributed, almost no one walks away scot-free. Mark's gospel is about who Christ is and what his kingdom's like, as we've seen for nine chapters. We know that Christ is God the Son come to bring salvation, and we know his kingdom is a gospel kingdom. His kingdom has an ethic that runs against the world's. And in our passage today, Jesus brings that to bear on how we think about divorce, reorienting, reorienting kingdom values. Our main point, our main point is that Jesus says divorce is because of sin. And he and he rejects all attempts to excuse sin. Jesus says divorce is because of sin. And he rejects all attempts to excuse sin. And I just want to get right to the matter. Um, I, I don't think that I'm coming at this from different angles today, and so I don't have any different points. I just want to think about unpacking what we've already said and looking at it from our text. Uh, this passage begins a new section that turns away from Jesus' Galilean ministry and starts his press toward Jerusalem and his, his passion, his death. Uh, and the story here gets going as the Pharisees come to test him and ask him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And undoubtedly, this question was centered uh, around debate among religious leaders of Jesus' day about Deuteronomy 24 which we read, namely verse 1, when a man takes his wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes, 
because he has found some indecency in her and writes a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house. Now, the debate around this verse uh, in Jesus' time was if indecency meant a strictly moral fault, probably uh, specifically on faithfulness, or if it encompassed any annoyance, which is how a lot of people wanted to take it. Now, notably, and I think that this comes into the testing aspect, uh, John the Baptist had been executed uh, in, earlier in our story uh, for his public criticism of Herod's divorce and remarried situation. And this questioning may well have meant to trap Jesus in the same discussion that led to John's death. Now, regardless of that motivation, I mean, clearly there's, a, there's something at work. They are trying to test him. And Jesus undermines the, the lawyering tactics in his reply. Now, notice the different emphases in verses 3 and 4 in how they're interacting. Jesus said, what did Moses command you? And they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. Now, Jesus wanted to know what God said ought to be done. And the Pharisees wanted to pull at what could be allowed. So even then, people wanted to make rules from the exceptions. Uh, The rule wasn't that you should get divorced, but that there were regulations upon it when it happened. Now we, I I think, I mean, we can can think about this more widely than just this, this topic. We try to do the same thing in a number of sinful ways. I mean, we, I think one of the most obvious, although it's, It's not the only one. Uh, Most of us, uh, in our single days, whether you're still there or or they've passed you, have to be honest that we wrestled with this danger that perhaps pertains particularly to young people. Um, That in relationships before we get married, we're asking this question, what can we do before we sin? And, and I think that the question itself is telling because, I mean, just like here, just like in any number of issues, it's just kind of the, the low-hanging fruit. As always, we shouldn't be asking how far we can go toward sin before we incur guilt. That's a bad question. How close, how close to the line can I get? I mean, that's a, how, how close can I get to a landmine before this is a bad idea? We ought to be asking how we can pursue purity most thoroughly in any circumstance. And we see how wrong-headed and wrong-hearted the attempt to widen permissions for divorce was. If If we think about the original provision... In Deuteronomy 24, those first four verses, I mean, this, the statement regulated what could happen in, in the case of divorce, presuming it happens. It, it provided safeguards for women in, in event of, in the event of divorce. So husbands who had left them could not return to mistreat them again. Because Jewish divorce uh, in the Old Testament period always aimed at remarriage. There wasn't just even break and we go our own way. So he's leaving her for someone else. And then she finds a family. He dies, whatever it may be. And he wants to come back. God said, you don't get to do that to her. Now, Now, what we see then is there's no statement there that divorce is good. It's assuming that it happens rather than outright permitting it. There actually isn't permission to do it. It's just God says, I know you're going to do it. So let me provide protections. 
And isn't it sinful nature to take provisions regulating situations where we wrong one another and warp them into saying that the ways we wrong each other are good? Pop culture, media, the therapeutic mindset of today have told us that divorce and broken homes are normal. Now, now they may be usual, and that is different from normal. We're told that really the main thing is that we should just make sure that I'm happy. Whatever that means for anybody else. Just, just insist on your own happiness. And you know what? I'm not the first one to note this in the slightest, but the attempts to normalize broken families as neutral as if they have no as if they're expected and have no consequences wildly ignores the skyrocketing levels of mental health issues pretty easily map alongside the skyrocketing levels of divorce we love to tell ourselves that sin has no fallout and it is a lie The Bible doesn't, or sorry, the, the Bible does, in fact, have categories where divorce is permissible. And yet it, it isn't really part of the discussion here. Because Jesus puts it on the nose regardless of that. Noting how all the provisions for divorce are because of our hardness of heart. Uh, regulations address situations resulting from hard hearts. People just will divorce, and so God gives protections. And God tries to put fences around what we will do. And since they are all, I mean, since divorce is because of our hardness of heart and provision regulating it is because of our hardness of heart that brings about these situations we know that divorce is a rotten fruit growing on a tree of sin the real command the command was in the creation narrative from the beginning of creation god made them male and female and therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife And the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. That is the command. And there are regulations and provisions given that people, sinners, won't keep it. And so divorce happens because we break God's design not only for the permanence of marriage, but moreover, how we treat each other in our marriages. Commitment is the biblical command, and divorce is the concession owing to our sin. God's God's authority grounds the sanctity of marriage, planting it in his creational, natural law purposes as its designer regardless of any existing legislative structures. And we should note how much Jesus' teaching is about protection from sin. And that was the, the original intent of Deuteronomy 24. And further, the Old Testament and Israelite law uh, had n- no criteria in itself as is obvious even even from our Old Testament reading, for for the woman to initiate the divorce. But Jesus refers to exactly such an instance in verse 12. And so in other words, uh, Jesus takes the protections for granted and expands them, uh, adopting, I mean, essentially accepting what was Roman practice. And so... Jesus' aim is renouncing sin and the havoc we wreak upon others by it. And that explains Mark's 
presentation of, of Jesus' public, absolute denouncement of divorce. I mean, clearly he had caveats, as other passages, and even, to some degree, his private conversation with the disciples shows. So he, he knew the caveats, he knew the exceptions, he, he knew that godly people can navigate very hard situations. But his point wasn't to give tips about how to steer our sinful desires through the law's provision. His point was to condemn what was wrong. The provision of a divorce because of our sin should be the exception and, and in no way opens the door for us to start thinking, well, divorce is great in any instance or even permissible in any instance. Selfishness is not a ground for divorce. They're not holding up their end just on, a, on the menial day-to-day level isn't grounds for divorce. Well, people change over time isn't grounds for divorce. And, and just to kind of bring the, all the, that together, we, we shouldn't be eager to find ways to fit our situations into the provision for sin. That's, that's, not, the, that's not where we want to live. And so, sticking closely to our passage, we've just emphasized Jesus' point that divorce is contrary to God's plan. And, and that ought not to be a controversial claim. Even, even as our minds want to drift pretty quickly to what the exceptions could be, I mean, I just urge us to stay planted in, in the central claim because even if you long to know those exceptions, because, well, I mean, even if it's because you're primarily a victim of divorce, feel it, feeling in a real way the toll it takes, I mean, that, that only underscores the point that you've been greatly wronged, which proves that divorce is contrary to God's design. And... And we ought to rejoice at this principle too. Because it reminds us of something beautiful. If you believe in Jesus, you are his bride. And Jesus will never leave you. And Jesus will never let you leave him. Sometimes our situations are so broken because of our sin or because of someone's sin against us that our marriages end. And Jesus will always stay with his people. We constantly sin against him. We give him every reason that he ought to leave. We are persistently unfaithful. And he is endlessly faithful. And the, the needed fine point on this is that no one is beyond Christ's unquenchable grace. If you're the child of a broken home, isn't it good to hear? It, it, it is good to hear that the God who is faithful is our Father. If you're single, wishing you're married, there's commitment. There's contentment available in the commitment that Christ gives to us because he is endlessly committed to love you forever. If you're married and you wrong your spouse, as all of us do, Jesus forgives you. If you're the victim of divorce, having been wronged and abandoned or had to leave, Jesus is your everlasting bridegroom who can bind up your wounds and heal you with his perfect love. And if it is specifically your sin 
that caused a divorce. Jesus died to forgive you as much as any other. There is no sin so great that we are beyond the reach of Christ's love. Often, consequences and pain remain in this life as the fallout of sin, be it our sin or someone else's. And the arms of Jesus' cross are wide enough to encompass every sort of sin that would keep us from God's everlasting blessed presence. In a world torn by the ravages of our actions, we rejoice that Christ is our bridegroom of the age to come. When you have faith in Jesus Christ, you are his bride. And our sovereign God will let nothing tear that union asunder. Let's pray. Father God, um, some moments we are more aware than others of the fallout of sin in the world around us, and certainly such as one when we considered this topic before us. And we are thankful that whatever extra wisdom we need in in navigating the, the circumstances and provisions of life, we're blessed to know that you don't condone evil things, that you call it what it is, that even when there are provisions necessary for, for navigating, for, for protection in the midst of sin, you don't make wrongdoing all right. And at the end of all things, you will right every wrong and wipe away every tear and that you will bring your people near to you no matter what we've experienced here in this world, and that we will have an everlasting family that will never do us wrong, and a bridegroom who is always good to us, and we will know him face to face and never have to worry that it will be a broken relationship. And so we pray that you cause our hearts to soar at this truth and help us, O oh God, to live in light of the immense love that you have shown us, that we might be loving and good to others, especially in our families. We pray every week that you might help us to be a church where the value of the family unit, unit is shown to the world, and we renew that prayer. Help us, O God, to be loving as husbands and wives, caring as fathers and mothers. Whatever our marital status might be, whatever our parental status might be, help us to be good family members and family members here that people might know that we are yours because of our love for one another. And so make this a place where grace abounds and it is obvious. We ask that in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.